Hello and welcome to Chat with a Doc, a new virtual health series brought to you by 50 Forward and Walk with a Doc. I'm Kelsey Mahaffey, the All of Us Project Director for 50 Forward, a nonprofit serving older adults located in Nashville, Tennessee. Today's program is made possible by 50 Forward, which is also a national community engagement partner for the All of Us Research Program. All of Us is a research program from the National Institutes of Health that aims to advance precision medicine. Specifically, All of Us is seeking 1 million people from diverse backgrounds, including older adults, to volunteer and share their health information, helping researchers find better treatments and cures for All of Us. Over 750,000 people have enrolled so far, with 80% of those coming from communities that are historically underrepresented in biomedical research. You can learn more about the program, as well as what research studies are happening right now, by visiting our website at joinallofus.org 50 forward. With me today is my colleague, Keith Richardson, who will introduce today's topic and special guest doc. Hi, Keith. Hey, Kelsey, and hello, and a big welcome to all of you tuning in to our Chat with the Doc episode today, featuring the topic, Plants That Power As You Age. March is National Nutrition Month, so we're thrilled to welcome Dr. Colin Zhu, otherwise known as the Chef Doc. I'll read a brief bio for Dr. Zhu, and we'll jump into the presentation. Dr. Colin Zhu is a board-certified in family practice, OMT, and lifestyle medicine. Passionate about the intersection of medicine, food, and nutrition, Dr. Zhu trained as a chef and a health coach at the Natural Gourmet Institute for Health and Culinary Arts and the Institute for Integrative Nutrition following the completion of his medical degree. To share his unique blend of medical knowledge with a wider audience, Dr. Zhu launched the Chef Doc in 2017, an online wellness and lifestyle education platform which has been featured in several publications. Dr. Zhu is an international speaker, the, the author of Thrive Medicine, How to Cultivate Your Desire and Elevate Your Life, and the podcast host of Thrive Bites, in which he interviews the latest health and wellness experts about incorporating a plant-powered lifestyle, enhancing emotional wellness, and creating a thriving mindset. He is also the creator slash director of a self-educational masterclass series called The Thrive Formula, which he combines inspiration, education, and practical tools on how to thrive. Here, you will learn the five to thrive pillars, food as medicine, functional fitness, relationships, community, and emotional resilience. He is currently based in Southern California area and has a virtual lifestyle medical practice called The Chef Doc, Lifestyle Medicine. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Colin Zhu. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and evening. We'll cover <laughs> all the time zones um, whenever you guys are watching live or later on um, at your leisure. Uh, really a pleasure to be here. Thank you uh, to all of us, uh, Walk With The Doc, and everyone else behind the scenes for making this happen, and really excited to be here. That is great, and I think we are ready for you to share your screen and talk to us about plants that power as you age. Awesome. So thank you again for having me. Uh, when I was thinking about this presentation, I was keeping in mind all the different types of questions that usually come. And as we advance in age, as life continues to travel one step at a time, uh, there's so many different types of nuances. And we are thinking about our individual health, as well as our family, our loved ones. But also, I, I like to invite you to be mindful as well in terms of how does your choices, daily living, whether dietary or lifestyle-wise, reverberates as a ripple effect uh, for outside of you, right? Um, how does that affect your family, your community, your environment, and also uh, as well as the planet that we all share uh, together? So 
the title is Plants That Power As You Age. And of course, though that's the main topic we came here for today. But I also want to put the presentation into context. So here we go. So what does it mean to have health? When I ask this to my participants, patients, and clients alike, it's always a common question that we need to ask ourselves. And it's very important because we all have our own different definitions. Is health simply a, uh, the definition of absence of disease or can it be more than that? And whenever we think about health, we think about it from different angles and vantage points. For this particular presentation, we think about food, right? And it's always an evolving, not just science, but food means so many different things to all of us. But health and well-being, which is something, uh, which is uh, another uh, concept to think about means different things. Is it moving your body? Is it getting adequate sleep? Is it joining a community? So I want to do this exercise with you guys and say to yourselves, looking at the screen, you have two words. And I invite you to ask yourself, what is it that is similar about these words? And what is it that is different about these words? I'll give you three seconds to consider. And so when you're thinking about this, right, what is similar, what is different, right? And what happens when I do this? As you can see, illness has the word I in it, and wellness has the word we in it. All right. So what does that mean on a deeper level? On a deeper level and having the concepts um, and the time period and context of the pandemic behind us um, and moving forward with that in mind, illness is a solo journey, right? And whenever we're battling with something, we are going through it within our own body. We are going through it in our own mind and emotional state. Now, wellness is different where we can incorporate this on a we togetherness type of perspective. So I want you to keep that in mind as we uh, move forward. To put this in the context, like I said, I think it's important to really talk about where our nation is um, currently. So these are our stats from 2021. As you can see, heart disease still remains the top killer of all Americans in our country and cancer being at number two. What's new is COVID, all right? And if you look at the rest, very, very similar. Um, these guys kind of jostle in terms of switching places. But as you can see, stroke, respiratory disease, diabetes, liver, kidney, they all remain similarly um, amongst each other, still in the top 10, okay? And it also costs the nation a lot of bucks. Here's some uh, stats for obesity. Pretty much virtually, if you guys were in front of me, I would say to yourself, look at the person to your left, look at the person to your right. One out of three adults are considered overweight or classified. Two out of five, about 43% have the classification of obesity. And one out of 11, which is about you know, roughly 9% have severe obesity. So if you add all this together, this is a very large percentage, 70, 80% um, of our nation that's battling with overweight or having extra weight. And this is an entirely different lecture on its own, but it also uh, can pretty much be associated with a lot of medical conditions. And going back to COVID, which is relatively newer um, to our history, but we're not new to pandemics, right? The last time we've had a pandemic was back in the early 1900s with the Spanish flu, right? But we've learned that there's certain conditions that have an increased likelihood or inclination of getting COVID. So if you look at this, do you see anything that is shocking? Asthma, respiratory disease, cancer, kidney, liver, diabetes, heart, 
right? Carrying extra weight, smoking. As you can see, when you're looking at going back to the top causes of death, it's very similar to if you have this or you know of a loved one that's battling with this, how it increases your likelihood of having COVID. So as you can see, there's common themes to this. Nothing kills Americans more than heart disease and stroke combined, right? It actually claims about 900,000 Americans every single year. If you guys remember when the first when the pandemic first hit in 2020, we always see breaking news on CNN, and you always see the stats, hundreds of thousands um, being killed by COVID, right? But I invite you to kind of think about this. We don't see this as breaking news in our headlines, and yet it claims 900,000 Americans every single year. And not only that, it costs the healthcare system a lot of dollars. In fact, the expenditures of healthcare um, costs to our gross domestic product is about 20%. So we spent a lot of money. So back in the day, and I'm hoping you guys have more of this, is this is what the family table looked like, right? But nowadays, it looks like this with the advent of internet, social media, and now AI, we are constantly in a noisy, distractible environment. This is a quote by the father of modern medicine. Let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. This is not a new phenomenon um, over the pandemic, but it has catapulted where we are so used to outsourcing our food. When I teach my patients, when we're outsourcing our food, um, it's basically everything outside of your household. We have a saying here at the at uh, my company, uh, the Chef Doc, is your health starts in the kitchen because you know what goes into your food in the kitchen, right? And everything outside of this, just like how we've outsourced labor to other countries, we've outsourced our food. And I, I invite you to think about this. Do the food businesses that you outsource to restaurants, takeouts, deliveries, Grubhub, uh, DoorDash, all these different companies, are they paying attention to your health? Or are they paying attention to their bottom line? Really quickly, um, fast food has been going on since the turn of the 1900th century. And they've done it very, very well where they've created an automated process where, for example, McDonald's has done this so well that a you know McDonald's in Wichita, uh, Kansas is exactly the McDonald's that you receive in Singapore because they have done it in such a consistent and uh, um, automated process. But with all this, what do you get with all that? You over time, this is this uh, need need not to be shocking for all y'all, but you know you're getting with your happy meal. Uh, I like to say higher in fat, lower in fiber, calories, sugar, salt different types of trans fat, portion sizes. Notice how 7-Eleven, the big gulps have evolved in size over time, right? And then all of this, it's not being controlled for the quality, right? We can put all kinds of additives, binders, chemicals, preservatives. And guess what? We also get a lot of foodborne uh, illnesses and affections with it, right? This is a study uh, talking about that in terms of your produce. Notice how you're getting a lot of bacteria that causes disease on your lettuce, right? How is that so? Well, you know, this is an entirely different topic by itself, but the, agro the animal agriculture is right next to the vegetable and produce uh, farms and the runoff uh, coincides. So that's why you're getting it. What's the impact of all this? Well, over time, we've gone from a one income household to two income household because women over time have joined this, uh, 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 the workforce as, you know, as they should, and women are becoming CEOs. So what does that mean? That means that there's less time in terms of that family table. There's less time in terms of cooking, right? So over time, food spending increased over time. 
um, because of that two income um, household, you have more food being outsourced. So thereby you have more calories coming from food uh, from the outside um, over time. Home food preparation, it went down over the last 40 years from 65 to 08 and eating away went up 40% from the 70 to 2010. And eating out is not that great, right? So, you know, it may taste really, really good. But think about this. Restaurants and the food business, they're all there to make a buck, right? So if they're all there to make a buck, then they're going to be using low, uh, they're going to cut corners in terms of costs and to make the same product. So if they're cutting corners, does that mean that the food and food ingredients that they're using is healthy? I would argue not. And on average, it costs more to eat out than making it yourself. In terms of diet and weight loss, um, people, we find that people who cook more actually consume less calories and thereby uh, actually are able to have better weight quality. These are cooking and obesity trends. There's lower rates of obesity, for example, for when we are spending more time cooking. This is studied in the French and the Italians and also the Brits. The Brits, which is comparable to our cooking patterns, actually experience the same rates of obesity, whereas the French and the Italians actually spend more time cooking, thereby have an inverse relationship of lower rates of obesity. And what about mortality, your rates of death? we find that the more time you actually cook in the kitchen, the um, inverse relationship it is, meaning that your rates of death actually uh, go down when you're cooking more in the kitchen. What does that mean when we're zooming out on a global scale? We've had large systematic studies in 195 countries over a time period of 1990 to 2017. And we find that dietary um, Risk factors are responsible for 11 million deaths um, globally. And again, a cardiovascular disease leads the way, followed by cancers and type 2 diabetes. There is a beautiful study called the Global Burden of Disease Study, and it's one of the largest systematic um, analysis of risk factors in human history. Leading cause of death in USA, as well as planet Earth, is a bad diet. And so what are the healthy foods, right? And based off of 150 dietary surveys, based off of the blue zones, which we'll come back to in a sec, is that they have noted that 95 to 100% is more plant forward than the better for you in terms of health quality. A little bit about me, guys. I am originally from New Jersey. I am the child of two immigrant parents, and I wanted to learn not just nutrition, but more about food. So I went to culinary school. I got certified in health coaching, and I needed to understand how food choices affected our individual health, and then also how our food choices affected the rest of our community. I'm dedicated towards teaching, and because of the healthcare system, and I'm sure you guys have your own uh, experiences. Who loves waiting in the waiting room for two hours just to spend less than 15 minutes with their doctor? And out of that 15 minutes, you're probably not going to get taught in terms of what to eat, where to shop, how to cook, and you know, really going through the nitty gritty um, with all that that actually matters. Just a couple of uh, pictures over time. And I think it's very important to walk your talk. Uh, this is me and my healthcare staff. Uh, this happened by accident. I was on a Native American tribe facility and I just needed to walk after lunch. And I did this every single day. Um, and then my healthcare staff members uh, continued with me. So in this picture, you have a pharmacist, a pediatrician, um, a health tech, a primary care doc, and it's very important to walk your talk and to be accountable yourself. My culinary experiences um, really led me to many di different and beautiful experiences. Um, I've per I'm humbled to say that I've traveled the world and I've given a lot of food as medicine applications in terms of public speaking, workshops, and demonstrations since 2016. 
So what kind of foods do I advocate? I don't like to use the word diet because it's associated with restriction. And so I am board certified in lifestyle medicine. And what that means is that we concentrate on evidence-based approaches that emphasizes lifestyle behavior modifications. And we talk about six pillars, diet or nutrition and food is one of the pillars. And so we use lifestyle a lot because at the core of what we're teaching, no matter if it's food or physical movement, it's really about changing behavior and changing how you approach every single day. And what do we need to do to make positive changes for healthy living? I advocate more from a whole food plant-based approach because that's where the best evidence is. We've known since 1990 that a low-fat whole food plant-based approach is able to reverse heart disease, our number one top killer. It's able to reverse type 2 diabetes and in some cases um, able to reverse um, some cancer. But as also being a family practice physician and primary care physician, I understand that people live on a spectrum. And it is unrealistic to tell someone night and day to turn vegan or to turn plant-based. So it's just simply eating more plants. If everyone in America incorporated Meatless Monday, for example, we would be at a much better spot. We have the ability as a country to feed 800 million people. There's only about 330, 340 million, right? We could actually make a dent for global poverty. And yet a lot of the food that we make goes towards animal agriculture. So, um, so eating more plants and I use the work of our lifestyle medicine pioneers, Dr. Dean Ornish, Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn and colleagues. So in general, when we're coming back to the subject at hand, this is from the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. We use a plate. We use a whole food plant-based uh, uh, plate. And our job is to be able to prevent, treat, and reverse chronic lifestyle-related diseases um, as a profession and specialty. So this is our uh, plate fruits and vegetables, which take up a large part of our plate, as well as whole grains. Plant proteins can be derived from nuts, seeds, uh, whole grains, um, beans, legumes, and water. As you can see, this is very different from what we're used to back in the day, the pyramid, right? The food pyramid. And, you know, there's actually no animal protein here whatsoever. And you, if you notice, there's also no glass of milk here whatsoever, right? Unfortunately, which is an entirely different topic, the USDA food dietary guidelines is a very, very um, layered and nuanced uh, type of subject to talk about. And so um, there's a lot of forces and entities that have deep pockets that really advocate certain things. Um, at the end of the day, we find out through research is not actually as healthy for us. For those, for those of you that follow Dr. Michael Greger's work, this is his daily uh, dozen. He is the founder of nutritionfacts.org. And this is all backed up by science. And these are your best foods for um, how not to die and also how not to diet. And his latest book, How Not to Age, um, which is awesome because this is a common thread in terms of all three, right? So his... Uh, his advocacy is really about incorporating more plants, uh, these types of food groups into your diet on a daily basis. This, for me, whenever I tell and teach people from a whole food plant-based approach, I like to say, eat from the rainbow, not Skittles, but eat from the rainbow. Because Mother Nature, in its genius, has been able to give us food that is able to optimize our body from so many different levels. And there's a reason why they're different colors, okay? Um, here is uh, a plant group, uh, different types of plant groups divided into their phytochemicals and their benefits, right? In general, guys, when we're talking about plant food, we're talking about your vitamins, your minerals, phytonutrients, antioxidants, and fiber. 
we as Americans are obsessed with protein um, when we need to be more obsessed with is fiber because 97% of Americans are deficient in fiber, not protein. Um, we are Americans actually eat twice as more, twice as much as protein than we actually need to. And it actually has delirious effects. And also the lack of fiber has delirious effects. So which foods do we want to consume more of as we age and hence the title of this lecture? Well, nuts. Consumption of nuts is associated with lower risk of dying from stroke, heart disease, respiratory disease, pretty much a lot of what we talked about before. And eating just a daily half serving of nuts is associated with 15% lower mortality risk. Two handful of nuts a week is the longevity equivalent of jogging four hours. So how many of you guys have, instead of a cookie jar or a candy jar on your desk, actually have nuts and seed jars on your desk? This is what I have. I'm looking at my desk right now. I have a jar of pistachios, macadamia nuts. Uh, I have hazelnuts, right? Um, and they're just in my face and they're telling me to eat them, right? And I think that if you have something in your face, then you're able to consume better, right? I also have my jar of water, right? And to tell myself that I need to be hydrated. Guys, we live in a very busy world. It's also very noisy and it's also very distractful. So we need to have constant reminders. And this is what we teach here at the Chef Doc is how do we better organize, prioritize, and prep ourselves for healthy living. Healthy living is the long game. It's a marathon, not a sprint. The healthy of nut is a walnut. It's loaded with omegas, antioxidants, and also uh, shows that it can improve artery function. Berries, next up our list is berries. A lot of pr prospective studies show us that berry consumptions is, uh, we're living longer with it than not eating enough. Reducing all cause mortality risks is as equivalent as green leafy vegetables. And the pigments, anthocyanins, which we talked about here on this uh, uh, handout, is shown to have not just cognitive effects, but also improves eyesight and also improves systemic anti-inflammatory uh, effects and also has beneficial glycemic effects, which means that if you're a type 2 diabetic, this actually helps. Greens. Lower risk of heart disease, stroke, some types of cancer, vision loss. Green leafy vegetables by itself make up 80% of our nitrate intake. Why is this important? Well, well, nitrates get converted into nitric oxide into our bodies, right? And what does that mean? Nitric oxide is a vasodilator. It helps with our artery function, our blood pressure. Um, athletes and athletic performance, we've studied that it actually improves it, right? There was a study done with just beetroot juice. Uh, athletes that consumed it before performance actually recovered and performed better, right? So, uh, and as per the study, healthy lifestyle preventable death, eating leafy greens every day, they suggested almost every day, but I advocate eating every day, is as powerful as not smoking, and walking for an hour plus every day. The microbiome, uh, we are studying this more and more and more. That's an entirely different lecture. But what we know that when we're transitioning from adulthood into wise and advanced age, it's we're also noticing that we're having pronounced changes. And what does that mean is that we tend to gain more inflammatory effects and what that means is that when you are having more chronic systemic inflammation because of this change of the microbiome, this increases your likelihood of being hospitalized, getting weaker, being less independent, and suffering from a variety of diseases. And so what does that mean? That means that if you can get yourself to a healthy microbiome, it's your best bet in preserving health. And we need to do this by preventing systemic inflammation. Um, quick tips in terms of how to do that. We want to prevent leaky gut, stop alcohol, avoiding NSAIDs, which is ibuprofen 
and minim minimizing uh, this uh, component called TMAO, which is a independent risk factor um, of heart disease. And we get this from eggs, meat, and energy drinks, entirely different topic. And I digress. So when we come back to your health starts in the kitchen, what are the barriers? What are the facilitators? Through studies, we've known that our barriers to cooking for ourselves is low confidence, lack of skills, limited time. How do we get better at this? Organization, preparation, planning, and actually enjoying cooking. And guess what? Through my work with people and patients and clients over time, it's not just cooking for yourself. You'll also improve your relationship, right? That family table, your spouse, your loved ones, your kids. What's the best way to cook? Experimenting, winging it, being not afraid to mess up, and nothing is perfect the first time, and repetition is the mother of all practice. And again, healthy living, it's really about organization, priority, and preparation. Few concepts that we teach as food is medicine, batch cooking, meal prep, delegating to other kitchen appliances, repurposing, storing and freezing, using leftovers, and portion control. And we also talk a lot about supermarket navigation and pantry navigation and how to shop for all that. I'm going really fast because um, I want to make sure that you guys get out on time. This is my contact information. Um, that's my website. This QR code goes to my app, which has been released uh, last year. And uh, the Chef Doc is uh, two main offerings. We have a, a coaching uh, uh, wing and we also have an app wing. So for uh, everyone today, just to make note that we have coaching services, we we are really, really important in terms of helping people improve their weight, prevent chronic disease. We're recruiting for the month of April, for those of you that are interested, and it's all about education. It's all about sustainability. We don't teach anything that's quick fixes here, and we want to get people better and not come back to us. This is what we currently offer on our app. Uh, we understand that people learn differently and at their own pace. And this is what we have here. And again, this is my contact information to learn more. Awesome. That was so great. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Zhu, for that wonderful presentation. Um, this has been great. Very informative. I know I'm going to take some of these nuggets back with me because I also have nuts too at my desk as well that I eat. Um, so yes, uh, great round of applause. Thank you so much again. Um, I know we have some questions for the audience, so let's get to those. Uh, if you have any questions for Dr. Zhu, please use the Q&A feature on Zoom or the comment section on Facebook. Yeah, this is just fantastic, Dr. Zhu. I made all kinds of notes here, and I love the rainbow of foods. And if you have that um, handout to share, we would love to send that out to folks because I'm sure there's other people that would love to have that um, as well. So um, special thank you to those of you that registered and submitted some questions in advance. So we'll get to those first. And anybody else that has a question that's watching, please drop those in and we'll see if we can get to those. Um, I think I might know the answer to this first one here, but somebody was saying um, they've heard it's best to not eat um, after 7 p.m., but when they eat that early, they're hungry by 9. So maybe any advice for a good bedtime snack? What's something that would fill up your tummy so you're not hungry? So this is an entirely different topic, but in terms of fasting, eating windows, um, again, that's an entirely different topic. If you go about your day on a day-to-day -day, um, and you go to sleep relatively from like 10 to 12, you wake up, uh, and this is different if you have a second shift, um, a swing shift or a graveyard shift, right? Everything is turned upside down on its head. But Basically, when your body is getting ready for bed, right, everything is basically winding down. I personally do not advocate eating after seven because when you're eating after seven, you're telling your digestive system to go back to work. And so that spells out a lot of trouble over time, right? You got to remember, if you're battling with a chronic disease, it's an accumulation of your entire lifetime of choices that got you to that chronic disease, 
right? It's not an overnight thing. High blood pressure, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, these are not overnight diagnoses, right? So you have to pay attention to uh, that. And I would say that if you're hungry, it's not true hunger. It's hunger pangs, right? It's not true hunger. And so you're getting hungry based off of a couple of things. Either A, you're not eating um, a fulfilling, satisfying meal with a diversity of the plant groups that I just showcased to you earlier. Um, and uh, basically, you know, your body's just used to eating something right before bed. So your body's operating off of a routine. It's not actual true hunger. So, um, so again, fasting windows, eating windows, that's an entirely different topic. So I personally don't advocate, it's ha actually healthier to not eat after eight o'clock. Awesome. I do have a, um, a pre-submitted question too for you, doctor. Um, yep. what are the best plants, um, from four to eight to blend and drink, um, yeah, I believe that's what they said. They said, what are the best plants? Um, I guess to blend, I, I'm assuming to put like in a, a Nutribullet or to blend together. Like, do you have any recommendations? Yeah. So on my website, I have a recipe um, category. And then I have my um, smoothie recipe that um, that is there as well. And I also just did a lecture. Uh, about how to make the ultimate blood pressure smoothie um, based off of the food scientifically backed to help lower um, and curtail your blood pressure, sometimes as effective as an antihypertensives. Um, but basically for different types of foods, I usually have a base of ginger, uh, I, ginger, garlic, one banana, a couple of app uh, apples as sweeteners. And then usually I do frozen berries. Usually I do mixed berries, right? So anywhere from raspberries, blackberries, and blueberries. I usually do a couple of handfuls of greens, right? So your mixed salad greens, like we talked about, uh, green leafy vegetables, chock full of nitrates, right? And then I also uh, put extra fiber, uh, uh, plant-based fiber into it as well, as well as chia seeds, hemp seeds, flax seeds, and sometimes nuts and seeds. Because quite honestly, one out of 10 Americans eat the recommended daily servings of fruits and vegetables. One out of 10, right? And out of that one of 10, uh, we're not actually getting our optimal nutrition, which is that's because of our modern agriculture and how much our soil health is really deficient in nutrients. Again, that's an entirely different topic. Um, so you have to be able to eat as many uh, as possible and you have to be able to do it in an efficient manner, right? Because we're all busy. I'm busy, you're busy. So, you know, best way is to just jam everything into a smoothie, set it, forget it, and that way you can get your servings. But once you start getting used to cooking more plant forward and more plant based, you're going to start to understand how to combine certain things together. And this is what we teach here at the Chef Doc. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah, that actually answers our question here. Um, foods to lower blood pressure with food or supplements. So that that's awesome. Um, and then somebody wanted to know, Dr. Zhu, what about foods to boost circulation in the legs? Are there foods that are, that are good for that? So again, going back to nitrates. Um, so beets, arugula, Swiss chard, kale, all the dark leafy greens, just basically go to the produce section and just stay there. Don't go anywhere else. And that's what's going to help your circulation. And, and something non-food wise, continue to walk. Uh, continue to walk, continue to move your body. It's your skeletal muscles that help your venous system and lymphatic system to bring and promote that circulation uh, to come back to the heart. We're meant to roam the earth and to continuously move. So we have to be able to make sure we break up our sedentary lifestyle and be able to keep uh, walking. So... I do have a question. Um, I don't know if we have enough time, but um, I've noticed recently, uh, Dr. Zhu, in grocery stores, there's been a like um, certain type of, not meat, but they're like supplements, um, 
like plant-based burgers. And I, I've heard that's kind of been on the rise, like it's very popular. Uh, do you have any thoughts about that? Are they healthy or are they just filled with just a bunch of stuff with fat or what's your opinion on those? So the reason why they exist is because we have a profound desire to eat meat, right? Um, a lot of our agricultural land, 70% of it, in fact, is actually dedicated towards raising animals, which basically at the end of the day only provides 18% of our calories. For a pound of steak, we have to pretty much use over 2,000 gallons of water. That is the equivalent of leaving your faucet on for 20 hours in order to produce one pound of steak, right? So we have a, a great uh, need to eat meat, right? But at the end of the day, I want you to, I want to remind you guys is that you're just eating the middleman, right? You're, if you're eating for the protein, well, ask the cow, chicken, pig, and lamb, where are they getting their protein from plants? Every single fruit and plant have protein. That's where the original protein came from. You're just ingesting the middleman, right? And so to answer your question, transition meats like Beyond Burger and Impossible is there to really help to transition in terms of having a replacement for actual meat, right? At the end of the day, we teach um, the spectrum of unprocessed to ultra processed. Unprocessed is basically what mother nature created, an apple, a banana, and an orange in its whole intact form, to ultra process, which is basically cereal that you see on your shelves, right? So your transition meats fall along in that process spectrum. So at the end of the day, when we're teaching whole food plant-based, we're advocating for minimally or avoiding processed foods. So, but we understand that people fall along on a spectrum. So if this helps you to eat more plants, then I'm not going to deter you away from it. I'm going to say, hey, this is just a transition. I'm okay with it now, but not for the long term. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, that is Awesome. I've never thought of animals as the middleman. That's going to change my whole thinking. I think about food now. I love that. Yeah. Um, we we that need so uh, we need protein, but it doesn't have to come from animals. We need calcium. It doesn't have to come from the cow. And we need omegas. It doesn't have to come from fish. We're all eating middleman. Wow. Wow. And it looks Learned like we something. do have, have a, yes, we well, are. I on hope so. Online. Yeah, we, we do have a couple of questions. Um, looks like in the chat, uh, if you don't mind, I can just go through a couple of these. Uh, first person asks, uh, what food help with menopause? It depends on what you mean by what, what are you helping with menopause? If you're saying, how do I stop menopause? Well, <laughs> ask the creator. <laughs> um, I'm sure symptoms, the symptoms that come with hormonal changes in your body. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so every female is different in terms of uh, that, right? In terms of getting different types of flare-ups and hot flashes and everyone's body constitution is different. So I would defer to having like a lifestyle medicine appointment with me to be able to answer that. It's a very hard to kind of answer that in a broad brushstroke. Um, yeah. Okay. Awesome. And last question, um, if you have time, are there any foods that help boost memory? Well, there's a great team of neurologists. Um, they are a husband and wife team called the, uh, the Scherzeis. Um, they're actually in Southern California. They're the author of the Alzheimer's Solution. And basically, omegas are known to help preserve uh, brain structure and brain function. Right. And so this helps with cognitive uh, benefits as well. So omegas are rich in walnuts, like we talked about before, flax seeds, hemp seeds, chia seeds. Right. And omegas, when we're not consuming it from fish, uh, where are the fish consuming their omegas from algae? Right. So again, we're eating the middleman. And guess what? If you're eating seafood, right, there is a lot of if we're not even talking about nutrition, there's a lot of sustainability issues with seafood. There's two Texas-sized 
land masses of trash in the Pacific Ocean, right? There's heavy metals there. There's plastics in the ocean, right? So what you're consuming with the fish is all that, not just tuna and salmon. And at the end of the day, we are taking more fish out of the ocean than the ocean can replenish. So experts have said that by 2050, seafood uh, fisheries will collapse because of that. So keep that in mind, not just nutrition. I'm a certified scuba diver, so I know firsthand of this is happening. Right. Well... I believe our time is up for today. Dr. Zhu, once again, thank you so much for just being with us today and just chatting about plants that power as you age. We really do appreciate it. And just a lot of good information that we took with us today. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. I hope you guys took something away and feel free to ask me questions. And I wish everyone good health and I'll see you out there. So great. Thank you, Dr. Zhu. And we also want to be sure and uh, send a special thank you to Walk With a Duck for partnering with us on this new virtual health series. Um, and a huge thanks to all of you that joined us from across the country today. We look forward to seeing you again on our next episode of Chat With a Doc in May. And remember, if you would like to learn more about or even join the All of Us Research Program, please visit our website at joinallofus.org slash 50 forward to see how you can become one in a million with all of us. We'll now leave you with a quick PSA about the program, and we wish each of you a safe and happy National Nutrition Month. Thanks so much for being here. All across the country, people are coming together to speed up what we can learn about health. The All of Us Research Program is calling on one million people to join us as we try to change the future of health. For your family, for future generations, for all of us. Visit joinallofus.org and find out how you can become one in a million.